Lord knows there are plenty of reasons to worry if we're so inclined. Massive wildfires, climate change, Ebola in the Congo, swine flu in Asia, and other virulent diseases. Killer asteroids colliding with Earth, galaxy gobbling black holes, a super virus unleashed deliberately or by human error, mega earthquakes and killer tsunamis, nuclear warfare, the population outgrowing food resources, the ozone hole and shifting magnetic poles, and more. In case we're not worried, there are professionals who will do it for us. Astrophysicist Stephen Hawking predicted that the human race won't survive the next thousand years. In January of this year, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists advanced the hands of the doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight, the closest it's been since the 1950s. While these scientists focus on the threats of climate change and emerging technologies, the nuclear risk was foremost in advancing the clock because major nuclear actors are on the cusp of a new arms race. Children of Men, a sci-fi thriller from 2006, considers a world just around the corner. The year is 2027 and all women are infertile. The world shudders at the death of the last 18-year-old, killed tragically. Without children, there is no hope for the future, and the world careens into madness. The human race can see its own approaching end as a species, and that vision has caused the present world's spiraling descent into chaos and anarchy. No children, no future, no hope. Here are some promotional posters for the film's bleak perspective. The future's a thing of the past, and will the last one to die please turn out the light? Current anxieties about the end and our Romans passage have something in common. Let's Take a look. Given these looming events on the horizon, what are we to do? With so many possible scenarios, how should we react? These potential events can trigger at least four nonproductive reactions. Some people prepare for departure, they simply check out. If they don't have an exit strategy, they'll find one. They're out of here. History tells of several groups who decided that difficult times were signs that the end was near. They got rid of their possessions, quit their jobs, and settled down to wait for the Lord's appearing. But they were wrong. Today, we're likely to check out in other ways. We withdraw from community. We refuse to get involved. We'd like to move away from the noise and chaos to a place of quiet and rest. We're looking for ways to simplify our lifestyle, not because it might be better for the planet's survival, but because it might be better for our survival. Others give out. The sheer volume of bad news exhausts them. Moreover, many are ready to conclude that we must be living in the last days. The signs seem to abound. The implications of this eschatological ennui are enormous. Many no longer believe they make a difference. They think that no matter what they say or do, Nothing will change. They can stand on a corner and shout at the top of their lungs, but people will simply pass by. Others are overwhelmed by the sheer numbers and have come to believe that the social problems we face are inevitable and will only ultimately be fixed 
by the return of Jesus and the inauguration of the peaceable kingdom at some future day. They're not interested in the transformation of this society when they believe such transformation is impossible and when the ultimate transformation is just a portent away. Some people freak out. They're immobilized by fear. Go back about 147 years to the night of the great Chicago fire of 1871. On that same night, another wildfire raged in nearby Wisconsin, consuming the city of Peshtigo, several nearby villages, and a million acres of forest. Nearly 1,200 people perished, and there might have been more, but for the efforts of a priest, Peter Pernan. As the voracious fire drove people ahead of it, many made for the Peshtigo River. When Father Pernan got there, however, he found most people still on the riverbank. They had looked at the immense conflagration and concluded that Judgment Day had arrived. So they stood there, thinking there was nothing to do but await their fate. Father Pernan, not buying that notion, started shoving people into the water, which broke the spell and mobilized the terrified crew, crowd who saw the water as salvation and leapt in it and lived. It's always good to remind ourselves at such time to embrace our baptismal vows and that no matter what is happening, it's not over for the planet until God says it's over. Most of us, however, probably zone out. We don't check out give out or freak out. We don't react at all. It's just a part of life to us and we forge ahead and go shopping. After all, only 29 days left to get your Christmas shopping done. Because truth be told, these catastrophic possibilities don't really concern us. What really chills us to the bone are other things. Cancer, heart disease, the children and the friends they're keeping, the marriage, relationships, job security, retirement. Think about it, it's things like this, not terrorism or nuclear war, that really concern us. It's not the possible looming events on the horizon that give us pause. It's the more immediate events in our lives. In the face of what seems like future catastrophes, people check out, give out, freak out, or zone out. These are four non-productive reactions to today's headlines. Maybe there's another way to think about time itself. Rather than a doomsday clock, some engineers are creating what they call the millennium clock or clock of the long now. Instead of the short attention span of our times, this clock seeks to measure deep time. Now, for many people, means the time frame of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, or shorter, while nowadays is about 30 years. The long now seeks to encompass all of human civilization, reaching backward 10,000 years, and looking forward for another 10,000 years. It's a mechanical clock powered by seasonal temperature changes that ticks once a year, bongs 
once a century and has a precision equal to one day in 20,000 years. Why, you might ask? We have pizza at the back, by the way, for someone. (laughs) Just saying. It's the right time. (laughs) Why would we have such a clock, you might ask? (laughs) We don't have to ask about pizza. We know why pizza, right? Why such a clock? Ideally, it would do for thinking about time, what photographs of the earth from space have done for thinking about the environment. Such icons reframe the way people think, so that rather than being prisoners of the present, imprisoned by the immediate, we might be free to think about the future in new ways, and that such thinking would positively impact our current world. A similar kind of reframing is what Paul is attempting to do with his letter to the Romans. He's trying to get them to reconsider their present circumstances in light of the future. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. Paul, while acknowledging the present reality of suffering, asserts that the glory that awaits us in God's final triumph is so magnificent, it outshines the current bleakness. God's future and our present are of two different categories. It's like comparing apples to chainsaws. As we continue reading, we see that God is concerned with more than just individual souls. God's plan is to redeem creation as well. Paul says, the whole creation is groaning in labor pains, and we ourselves. To say that how creation is treated is unimportant, as some Christians have, is to underestimate its importance to God and to overlook how intimately interwoven within it we are. We are not separate and apart from creation, but as creation groans, so Paul says, we groan. The groaning we experience awaiting the redemption of our bodies is echoed within the larger creation, one that groans in labor pains. Something new is being born within us and the world. Jesus isn't coming just to save humanity, to wipe every tear from our eyes, but also to redeem creation, to make a new heaven and a new earth. If we condense the entire 4.6 billion year history of the planet upon which we live into a single 24 hour period, with each second representing 53,000 years, we come up with the following. At 12.10 a.m., a planetary object collided with Earth and became the moon. At 12.45 a.m., the Earth's surface cooled, and at 3 a.m., there was a massive asteroidal bombardment. At 4 a.m., the oceans formed. The first single cells formed there at 5.30 a.m., and at 8 a.m., the first photosynthesis occurred. Cell development continued, and at 7 p.m., the first multicellular green algae appeared. Fish appeared at 9.10 p.m., while land fungi and plants appeared between 9.28 and 9.34 p.m. The ancestors of amphibians moved from the ocean to land at 10 p.m., while at 10.47 the dinosaurs appeared, 
And at 11.39 p.m., they disappeared. At 11.59.22, the ancestors of humanity appeared. And at 11.59.56, Homo sapiens appeared. This condensed timeline gives us a sense of scope of humanity's place within the larger framework of creation. As immense as this time frame is, however, Paul reaches even farther back before there was time in order to reframe our perspective yet again. He's already reframed our present by reference to a future glory. Now he reaches into the primordial past to do the same. He says, those whom God foreknew, he also predestined, called, justified, glorified. Before there was time, God had a plan for those who are called according to his purpose. God foreknew and predestined those who would be conformed to the image of his son. Paul isn't trying to explain why some people are believers and some aren't, nor whether God knows all the details of the future, nor whether God's knowing of such determines what will occur. Paul's simply trying to assure believers that they participate in God's saving plan that stretches from eternity to eternity, from a past predestined to a future glorified. In waiting for the end, we need to be reminded of how long it was before our beginning, and to consider where we'll be in 10,000 years. Both a long look backward and a far look forward are necessary for us to learn how to wait until the end. Given this reframed perspective on time, we can now appreciate Paul's particular advice on how to wait until the end, whenever it may come. Having both past and future in view, our present becomes illuminated, and our waiting becomes empowered. Paul says two things about how we should wait, which at first glance seem contradictory. On the one hand, he says, wait with patience. And on the other, wait with eager longing. Patience and eager longing may seem mutually exclusive but they are part of the same piece of eternity. We wait with patience in the present because God foreknew and predestined us from the primordial past. We wait with eager longing in the present because of the future glory about to be revealed to us. Keeping both past and future in mind reframes how we live in the present. Waiting with patience is something we do while making bread. Mixing the ingredients, kneading the dough, and waiting for it to rise. Waiting with eagerness is what we do while the bread is baking. 
inhaling the delicious aroma as it fills the room of our home. One day, St. Francis was weeding his garden and someone asked him, Francis, what would you do if you knew Jesus was returning tomorrow? He said, I would finish weeding my garden. Not checking out, giving out, freaking out, or zoning out, but being fully present in the here and now, knowing from whom we came and to whom we shall return. Thanks be to God. Amen.